In the fall of 2016, I was traveling around the U.S. to visit some friends, and my last stop was in Florida. After a bit of scuba diving and other tourist stuff, we got talking and I'd mentioned that I'd never seen a rocket launch. So I checked the Kennedy Space Center website to see if there were any coming up. There was going to be a launch a few days after I was scheduled to fly home, so I delayed my flight so that I could drive down and watch it. I didn't know anything about what was being launched, but I knew I was about to see a tower of explosives be launched into space, so I didn't really care one way or the other. We spent the afternoon wandering through the Space Center, ate our obligatory freeze-dried strawberries, since I was lactose intolerant at the time, then headed out to find a good place to watch the launch. The launch was scheduled for 5.40pm, but delays and errors kept pushing it off. As we approached the end of the launch window at 7pm and the sun slowly set, we anxiously listened to the live stream of Command and Control, and waited to hear if we were go for launch, knowing it would be scrubbed if there was less than 15 minutes left in the launch window. All of a sudden, at 6.35, we hear a burst of activity from Command and Control. T-minus 10 seconds and counting! The rest of the crowd waiting on the docks all heard the call and started counting down. Suddenly, there was a blindingly bright light from across the water. We couldn't hear anything, but I stood in awe as I watched the rocket slowly lift off the ground and a hunk of metal the size of a building shoot into space. As we packed up the car to head home and I was dreaming about that beautiful light in the distance, the rocket continued its journey up, up, and away, and that was the last I thought I'd hear about it. But I couldn't have been more wrong. That rocket was carrying NASA's newest weather satellite, which they called GOES-R. These days, it's alternatively called GOES-R and GOES-16. The next time I'd think about GOES was a few months later when my friend Artem first told me that it was possible to get data directly off of satellites in space. And you've probably seen the result of that conversation. Using 1970s technology, we managed to receive these images off the polar orbiting satellites NOAA 15, 18, and 19, and then these higher-res photos off the Russian Meteor M2. Once we'd managed that, my mind once again returned to that bright dot on the horizon, and I began to wonder if it was possible to get data off of GOES. Now, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, this won't be the first time you've heard me mention GOES. We've been working on this project for several months now, first building massive antennas, machining custom filters, and trying time and time again to pick up even a whiff of a signal. Well, I'm happy to report that we've finally succeeded, and here are the results. This composite is a mixture of the visible channels that were lit by the sun when we first received them, and the infrared channels that could see the night side. In this video, I'll be taking you through how we did this and how you can do it yourself. In this first part, we'll be focusing on the capabilities of the satellite, what these signals contain, the hardware needed to receive them, and briefly, the software we used. We'll dig more deeply into the software in a future video when we revisit the corner reflector and filters we made in a previous video. So, first off, let's talk about the satellite and what it sends out. GOES is equipped with a huge array of instruments and sensors, and it sends out all of that data in real time to anyone who can see it. Unlike the satellites we looked at previously, GOES is a geostationary satellite, so from our perspective it's always in the same place in the sky, as its orbit has it moving at the same rate as the Earth rotates. Those earlier satellites orbit at an altitude of 807 kilometers, whereas GOES orbits at 35,758 kilometers. GOES puts out two main signals. The ATRIT signal we'll be looking at today, and the GRB signal which will be the topic of a future video. The ATRIT data doesn't contain all of the information the satellite generates, and instead is made up of lower resolution images from select instruments and channels, as well as rebroadcasts of data from other satellites. The two satellite rebroadcasts in the ATRIT data are from Himawari 8, which is the Japanese geostationary weather satellite and gives us a view of the other side of the planet, and GOES-15, which is serving as the West Coast Observation Satellite until GOES-17 comes online. The Himawari data comes with three channels, one visible and two infrared. In the first image we received, we could only really see Australia, as Japan was under a hurricane at the time. In a later image, we could see more of Asia, India, and parts of the poles, as well as a sliver of Alaska. Thus far, we haven't had any GOES-15 images come through yet, but we only have a couple hours of data. Here's a breakdown of what's included in the ATRIT data. This list was actually broadcast to us directly from the satellite, though it could have just been looked up online. You can see that there are a few visible channels, but most of them are in the infrared, which makes sense because those wavelengths are more useful for studying how particular molecules are moving through different parts of the atmosphere. There's also text broadcasts and some images which include forecasts, warnings, and other information about tropical storms and other inclement weather. I mentioned earlier that the photos we get are lower resolution. The satellite takes images which are about 21,000 pixels square. The images that come through on HRIT are reduced to about 5,000 pixels wide, which is still awesome, but not quite enough to see super fine details. However, cropped images at full resolution come through of details that command and control think are worthwhile, like the hurricane that just hit New Orleans. Earth images aren't the only thing that come off the satellite, and it actually takes pictures of the sun in six different wavelengths, but those images are contained in the GRB data and don't come through on HRIT, so we'll look more at those in the future. So now the big question, what's it actually take to receive these signals? Well, the hardware is actually relatively easy and cheap, totaling about $200. 
First we need an antenna, and these cheap Wi-Fi grid antennas work wonders, which you may notice is the face off of Pipsqueak. Then we need something to receive the signals with, and for our first test we found that these dirt cheap RTL SDRs work well enough, but later switched to my new Nesder Smart XTR, which Newelec was kind enough to send me to help with this project. We're also slowly working to develop a patch to enable HackRF support, but it may be a while. Because GOES is so far away, the signal is extremely weak, which is why we need a dish like this, rather than the omnidirectional antenna we used last time. And unless we use an absolutely massive dish, we need a way to boost the signal so it's loud enough that we can actually pick it up. But if we boost just everything, it'll be drowned out by noise. So we need a combination of a filter and an amplifier. Conveniently, Newelec recently released a filter-amplifier combo for just such a purpose, which they call a Sawbird filter. They actually make three versions for different satellites, but the one we want is made specifically for GOES, and only lets an 80 MHz wide chunk of frequencies through, centered at 1688 MHz. Because I'm in Montreal, the signal still isn't strong enough with just the Sawbird, so I also picked up a pair of broadband low-noise amplifiers to boost the signal further. For our setup, we used an adapter to connect from the antenna to the first amplifier, which is then connected to the Sawbird, and then finally to the last amplifier before it's fed into the radio. One extra mod which really helps to boost the signal is to add a little spacer between the forward reflector and antenna on the dish. I just used a 2.5cm long piece of PVC and some zip ties to hold it in place, and our signal was way better. Now all we need is some software to make this work, and we'll be capturing images in no time. We used the GOES Tools programs made by Peter N, which is in turn based off of work of Lucas Teske and the Open Satellite Project crew. There's a lot that has to be done to turn the radio noise we receive into actual info, and Lucas has an awesome set of blog posts where he goes through all of the maths required to make this work, which I've linked to in the description. To be frank, this is super outside of my wheelhouse, so it's largely over my head, but everyone involved spent a lot of time and even had a bit of help from NASA figuring out how to first demodulate, then decode these signals, and turn them into usable data. GOES Tools is made of two core pieces. The first is GOES Receive, which handles the radio side of things and turns the radio signal into a stream of packets. It then sends this data over TCP to the second program called GOES PROC, which takes those packets, does a bunch of math voodoo to it, sorts through them all to find out where the actual data starts, then goes about turning that data into files. The install instructions are posted on Peter's GitHub page, and I've put a link in the description. As I said earlier, we'll go through the command line stuff to make this work in a future video, but the instructions are pretty well documented on their site. One quick note is about what these numbers mean when you fire up GOES RECEIVE. The most important number is the Viterbi, which is a measure of how clean the incoming signal is. For this to work, you need a Viterbi of less than 400, but the lower you can get it, the better. Then the RS, or Reed Solomon value, is how much error correction the software is having to do on the incoming data. Again, lower is better. And finally, the packet and packet drop numbers are how much data is making it through and how many errors there were. You want zero packet drops for this to work well. Okay, so we've got our hardware and software set up. All that's left is to go outside and give this a try. Now, I've admitted the overwhelming majority of footage of this, as we spent many, many days trying this with no success, as we slowly upgraded and tweaked our hardware until we found the combination of stuff you just saw. Also, and this is really important, when you go to try this, make sure you're pointed at the right satellite. The first few days we were testing this variant of our hardware setup, we were pointing at what we thought was GOES-16. We used my HackRF to validate the signal was in the right spot and looked right, and we could see the packets were coming in over TCP. But we couldn't figure out why we weren't getting any images. A few messages to Peter later, and it was suggested that the unusual number of zeros in all those packets meant that we were probably pointing at GOES-17, which was recently launched and hasn't come online yet. Now, this may have changed by the time you're watching this, and we'll be doing a video on getting some data off of GOES-17 so that we can be some of the first to get images from it, but at the time, it was dead in the air. And all it did was earn me the Golden Turnip Award for not double-checking to make sure we were pointed in the right direction. See, the issue was that the Satellite Finder app I use doesn't have GOES-17 in it yet, and its accuracy isn't super great. So it never occurred to us that there could be a satellite with the identical signal in nearly the right spot. And there's only a 15 degree difference between the two. After realizing our mistake, we set up again, this time making sure we were pointed at the right satellite. Instantly, data started flowing in as soon as we set things running. The sun had already set at this point, but within half an hour, sure enough, a beautiful color image came through where the west coast was still clearly visible. Peter also just put a patch through that does map overlay, which I think is a really nice touch to help make these images more understandable. The patch just went through, so our first images don't have the overlay, but our new ones do. And with that, the story arc was finally complete. The thing I've been talking about for years at this point has finally been done. Now, that's not to say we're done with GOES. I'm still pouring over all of the data we received, and we'll show some more highlights in a moment, but we have a lot more plans for GOES in the future. Before we get to the final show and tell, I just want to say a huge thank you to Lucas and his crew, and you should absolutely go subscribe to Lucas's channel and follow him on his various pages. Also, a huge thank you to Peter for writing the Ghost Tool software and the help he gave, and the many years spent developing it. 
And finally, the biggest thank you to Paul for helping me get all this working and putting up with my constant nagging to work on this. Okay, show and tell time. While the slideshow plays, I wanted to take a moment to say a huge thank you to my amazing patrons who helped make these videos possible. If you want to support open source science like this and the continued production of science videos, then consider heading over to my Patreon and kicking a buck or two my way. It helps pay for materials to do these awesome projects while letting me continue eating, which I'm told is something you're supposed to do regularly. Speaking of supporting the channel, a while back I made these awesome My Other Cameras in Space shirts, and I know I'll be wearing mine proudly after the success of this project. If you want one for yourself, I put a link in the description. And with that, I'll wrap up this video. As always, if you enjoyed these videos, then be sure to subscribe, and most importantly, ring that bell to see when these weekly videos get posted. And if you'd like to see project progress, then be sure to follow me on Instagram and all the other social media platforms, which I've put links to in the description. I'm constantly posting photos of projects as they develop, so you'll see what I'm working on long before it makes it into the video. Links to everything I used in the video can be found in the description. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.